so yeah, I want to say thank you to the Howe Library and Jared and Megan for organizing the series. And um, like I already said, you all for joining me tonight. And I mean, in an ideal world, this would be, you know, a session that we could be gathering and discussing with each other and hearing about what seeds we're ordering for the upcoming growing season. And, um, but we will adapt as we do as human beings and, um, and do this kind of virtual presentation, which I think also has some silver linings. So um, thank you all for your flexibility with the format. And like I said, if, I, if we do happen to run into each other out there in the, in the gardens or in between gardens, I hope we can say hi and um, you know, share how, how it's going and how we're doing with our growing aspirations. Um, so hopefully, I, I just shared my screen. I'm hoping you all can see what I'm looking at as well, which is just the title of the presentation tonight, um, which, is, which is Guilds and Species, a Biodiverse Landscape. Um, so we kind of started with the general overview uh, with the series as far as like um, what permaculture is and that um, as a concept in theory and in practice. And, um, and then we kind of looked at some soil and water and ecosystem functions. Uh, the last talk, and now we're diving into kind of some specifics of um, varieties and plants, um, both native and non-native, that um, I really like to work with and I think are really, um, I like to encourage because they are incredible, um, kind of like multi-functional um, ecosystem function and um, drawing pollinators and insects. Um, so anyway, we, we are so fortunate to live in a temperate climate where actually the diversity of what we have um, accessible to us and to work with and integrate with is quite large. So anyhow, my name is Karen Ganey and I'm the um, kind of owner founder of Permaculture Solutions and I do um, consultations and designs and sometimes educational series like this um, and uh, for the kind of the upper valley. And um, I've been doing this work for, um, I, I, for I've been studying permaculture probably like, like in practice um, for over 15 years, um, but I kind of came across it almost 20 years ago in theory and kind of observation. So I've really appreciated it as a framework for um, connecting with land and learning from nature, uh, which I feel like are really the two um, kind of fundamental experiential aspects that permaculture brings. Um, and of course, there's the ethics and the principles which inform our design process. So anyhow, that's like a quick overview, a little tiny bit of what we've covered in the past. So um, let's dive in. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the two uh, concepts, guilds and polycultures. Um, what are they conceptually and in practice? And we'll be seeing some kind of examples of those and talking about some good groupings of plants that work well together. Um, I'm going to just share a little bit about why native, um, and it's a, it's a really kind of interesting topic, and I'm sure we, there's a, I'm not the only one on the call with um, opinions that are kind of, you know, kind of across the spectrum. Um, I do like to encourage natives. I, I'm, I've really kind of gotten more into working with native shrubs over the past couple of years because of their incredible ability to increase um, biodiverse habitats. So um, anyway, we'll talk a little bit about that, and then we're going to dive into ecosystem functions, which if you've been here with us for the past two talks, you've now heard a bunch. And these are just the incredible um, cycles and functions that plants um, and, you know, soil um, and um, species kind of all interact and are, are integrated into the uh, beautiful web of life. We're going to look at specific species selections and the ecosystem functions that they provide. Um, so you'll be able to really kind of leave this talk tonight with a comprehensive list of um, plants and cultivars that um, I really love and I've, I've seen time and time again encourage um, species diversity. Um, so when we talk about guilds and polycultures, really what these are are, um, are plant communities. And a guild is generally just a reference to a grouping of plants that provides a specific function. So in this context, we're going to be talking about um, groups and groupings of plants that, for instance, 
are nutrient accumulators. So they bring nutrients of all kinds um, and make them more accessible to other plants. Um, pollinators, insectaries, these are plants that provide these specific functions that increase kind of biodiversity um, as in, within a system. And um, a polyculture is basically a grouping of plants that has a number of different guilds that may be involved or different plants that have that are part of different guilds. So there would be a nitrogen fixer, there would be a pollinator, there would be a um, nutrient accumulator, and there would be groupings of plants that kind of fit all of these different niches, these are all ecological niches, um, so that the health of the whole system can really thrive. And what we're really wanting to do is kind of maximize beneficial relationships like between and among these plants. And by doing that, what we're doing is we're really enhancing the health and the vitality of the entire system. Um, there's more nutrients that are getting recycled. That also includes water. There's um, more species that are created, um, that, are, that are in habitat and different niches within these systems. But um, anyhow, so here's just kind of a little, just kind of some simple definitions of guilds and polycultures, because you'll hear a lot of these terminologies when um, we're talking about plant communities and really kind of expanding our thinking around garden design and inspired design. Um, and in some ways, I feel like what we're doing here is kind of merging the world of like gardening and ecology and thinking about like we want to be integrated and working with systems that are producing our calories and our nutrients and our medicine, maybe our fibers, um, but that is also really giving back to the land. And I think the more that we work with the land to grow our own food, we recognize that um, reciprocity is a really kind of important concept that we can really develop and be in relationship with and be kind of constantly thinking of like, how are we giving back? And personally, I believe that this um, action in itself is um, something that can really help to heal um, a lot of our different aspects of our culture. So what am I talking about when I'm talking about ecosystem functions? Um, basically, what we're doing is enhancing um, the, the cycles, the relationships between and among things. So every one part that's integrating with the entire ecosystem or guild is um, is there's multi um, functions that are happening. So there's berries that are getting eaten. There's mulch that's happening from big leaves that are kind of falling and decaying on the ground. There's soil life that's building. There's water that's getting recycled. There's mycelium that's growing from the different root exudates. And we talked a little bit about this at the, in the last talk, but these are the sugars that um, come from the process of uh, the nutrient recycling that happens right at the kind of the, the, the part on the plant surrounding the root um, formation. And there's a lot of like different interrelations relationships that are occurring in these spaces. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we're doing. We're designing to maximize these relationships. And one of the ways that we do it is by this kind of this term called forest gardening. And, um, and when I talk about forest gardening, I think really what we're doing is we're looking to the forest for inspiration um, because we're you know, starting to garden in such a way that we're integrating with the natural cycles and natural systems. So why not look to the most incredible expert that there is, uh, which is the forest, um, which is an ecosystem that you know, really um, in reality has zero waste. Everything is kind of growing and um, photosynthesizing and producing and capturing carbon and recycling nutrients and then dying back and feeding the forest floor. And um, it's incredible the, what these cycles do and how truly undervalued they are in our society for everything that they're providing. So if we can be kind of working towards these, um, these systems of gardening and functioning, we might be on our way back to kind of some kind of balance. Uh, but anyhow, so, and it's often, it's not necessarily growing in a forest as much as it is growing like a forest. And um, so within a forest and kind of pictured here in the slide, you can see there's a lot of different levels. There's a canopy level that's like the highest tree. There's a mid-story kind of shrubbery level. Um, there's an understory of maybe like, you know, kind of dwarf berries and perennials. Um, and then there's a ground cover story. 
And then there's another, another, an even another layer, which is a vining layer, which is kind of occupying that vertical space that is um, between and among these different species. So really it's incredible um, how much can kind of occupy a certain space of land. And when we think about it, um, recognizing that everything within this system is getting what it needs. And so, but it's not doing that alone. It's doing that because of the functions and the ecosystem functions that the other plants around it are providing. Maybe they're, you know, there's early blooming perennials next to fruit trees to bring those pollinators in. Um, so it's really beautiful. Like we're not doing anything that is kind of like working against nature or bringing in things that would, will not benefit the whole of the system. And that's another thing I think of in forest gardening and um, is in, in even species selection. We want to bring things that provide multiple functions that are on this list here on the left side. Plants that are attracting pollinators um, and also bringing kind of nutrients by way of mulching, uh, maybe nitrogen, fi fixing nitrogen into the soil. Um, and so as the many functions that we can get into each plant, you can imagine how the whole of the system will benefit from this. And so I think oftentimes, and we've all been here and I've done this so many times and, you know, you go to the nursery and you're kind of looking th through, you know, what you might want to plant in your garden this year. Maybe you're going to put some annuals with your perennials, which I highly recommend. Um, but really thinking through what is our process for decision making and getting to really know different species for what they um, how they enhance the overall landscape and like their bloom times and um, how they might be enhancing the soil. Um, so anyway, it's a really, it's a world of um, incredible information out there. And um, yeah, so, and we're gonna go over some, some more of it here. Oh, so this is, oops, this is just a slide. Um, I, I realize that it's, the, we can't necessarily see the words so much, I didn't realize, but just to give us an image of like what that forest is really looking like. You can see there's not a lot of wasted space here. And imagine that, you know, the space that you see in the trees, in between the trees, um, that there, and the forest floor, those spaces would be occupied with uh, bacteria and nematodes and worms and fungus and mycelium. Um, and so there's really a lot that's happening. It's a very much an organic and living system. So when we take that idea of for like gardening, um, like a forest and kind of apply it to a growing system, this is something, um, or this is an example of what that would look like. Um, I wonder, can you all see also me moving our heads around the screen when I do this? I'm gonna put us over here. Um, so let's see, I'm just gonna get rid of it. Excuse me, just a second. I'm just gonna try to, okay. Oops. Okay, that's better. Um, and so kind of the image on the left is an example of like, what are the really different, like the spaces between these plants and, um, and what does it look like? And I feel like, in this case, and on a lot of other cases, a picture is really at that worth, what do they say, a thousand words. Um, because the more comfortable that we are with interplanting different species of things, the, the better kind of designers and gardeners that we'll be when we're really applying these principles. And I really, I like to kind of bring this um, aspect of um, gardening and how we're gardening into creating these ecosystems too, because you know, remember part of this process is also connecting with ourselves. Like our gardens are our place of sustenance, our place of nourishment, um, both physically and, you know, mentally, spiritually. And I think it's when we have a growing system that is within a sizable proportion and um, is planted in such a way that feels natural to our bodies and our systems, the other things that are happening that we don't often talk about or I think more so now are, are getting talked about is like our nervous systems are getting regulated. Like our, um, you know, our skin is kind of enlivened and our senses are increased. And so there's something to say, and I really only learned this over the course of all these years that I've been gardening more like, um, like this with integrated perennials, you know, and annuals and tree crops and berries is 
when we're moving within these systems, it feels really natural. And like we're weeding around plants, but we're not doing it in such a way that we're like facing, you know, like 10 acres. I mean, that would be even like kind of a smallish large scale for Vermont, but even in industrial scale farming, monocrop systems are just so completely different where you're doing one thing over and over and over again. It's like not good for our bodies. The food that's being grown is lacking in nutrition. The soil is being depleted. And, um, and it's just becoming less cost effective to actually grow the bulk of our food this way. Whereas if we have these layers, uh, imagine, and we're stacking these layers based on um, both bloom time for pollinators and enhancing that ecosystem in the early part of the spring, but we're also planning these design systems based on harvest times. So we can literally create growing systems where we're harvesting something from the early part of the spring until the late fall. And also we can do this within pretty small areas, as you can see, you know, by some of these drawings. Um, anyway, so I guess that's kind of a little bit of a side note, but also just to really say that like there is more that's being enhanced aside from like ecosystems and carbon sequestration and increasing biomass. There's things that are happening within us in our process and connecting and growing like this in the way that we feel when we're working with all different types of plants. Um, which I also think can be applied to a social scale and social justice as well. Um, so anyhow, so this is what it looks like. Um, this is a very common um, grouping of plants. And we're going to look at a couple of other groupings where there's a kind of a larger tree that really is kind of um, the centerpiece, if you will. And then there are other things that are kind of planting around that that are, are both kind of supporting the whole and also that centerpiece. So maybe it's a pollinator, maybe it's a nutrient accumulator, maybe it's comfrey um, or borage, which can provide beautiful mulch. Um, and I think the point here is as well is to not necessarily get so hung up on like the specific species and what they're providing. Although I'm going to provide you like lists of everything, um, but is to just start thinking conceptually of the design and recognize that there's going to be a lot of relationships that are happening, you know, between these things. And this is still a world of you know, wonder at where uh, we're still discovering, you know, some of the things that are happening in the soil and in the soil humus and how the organic matter is being recycled. Um, you know, and some of these plants have really been studied and, and obviously create great habitat and feed lots of different species. So um, anyhow, so it's very exciting to think of different gardens in this way. And I hope that at some point you're starting to think of like, oh, in my backyard or oh, in that corner, I might be able to plant some things or, Here's where I could start this um, and get curious about it. Um, okay, so why native? And so I really, looking towards nature and understanding also that we're living in a time that some people are referring to, and by people, I mean, you know, 90% of the science, 97% of the scientific community, um, is that we are living in the time of um, incredible climate changes um, and also, uh, recognizing that there's uh, been a, a tremendous amount of species lost at an astronomical rate of like, you know, many, like 100 a day. Um, so what we really want, I think that like it makes sense for us to kind of accept that uh, we are going to have to adapt to different circumstances. And some of the best ways to adapt is to look to what the natural world around us is already doing. And so native species of plants, they've already kind of adapted to a lot of the different elements that exist within this area. And it's not to say that they are dependent on, you know, the cold or the rain that they get at certain times. It's to say that when they're, when they've kind of um, grown numerous, numerous generations within a bioclimate, they have the more adaptability. And this is kind of a common sense and it's somewhat obvious as well. I mean, we obviously know that if we bring something up from a warmer zone to this zone, it's not going to make it through the winter. Um, so, but natives are also, they support more of the insect life. And so one of the ways that we can um, start to kind of turn the corner and mitigate the different changes that we're going to see through climate change is really to kind of increase biodiversity and be thinking of habitat. And especially on the small scale, um, we recognize that there's some, there's certain big changes that we're going to see, but the tiniest ones among us are kind of indicator species um, regarding, you know, the climate and the, and the changes to the ecosystems. 
And so these are obviously little bugs and insects. And we're going to be talking about them today in terms of what they what brings them to the garden because they're incredible. Um, but also to recognize that it's the native species that really kind of provide food for multiple species um, versus things that we're kind of bringing in from out of this climate or zone. Um, so there's less inputs needed to grow healthy plants when they're native. Um, and also we're gonna be talking about pests because clearly there are pests, pests, many of which attack our annual gardens. But really, honestly, the majority of pests out there, and I, I don't have the specific numbers, but we could find them pretty readily, um, are either beneficial or neutral. And I think creating an ecosystem where we have multiple ecosystem functions and niches operating together will basically eliminate the need for inputs for pesticides or, or any kind of control related to pests because there's already biological controls that are built within your system. So it's like the more that we start to see like how um, natural design and working with natives um, benefits like biodiversity, it's, it's ridiculous to think that we're not prioritizing these types of um, decisions on a, on a large scale um, because we can really create more biodiversity and bring back, we can re-green deserts, um, it's as simple as that. But anyhow, that's another presentation. Um, so this is just a, an example um, when we're kind of thinking about design and again, and like enhancing those ecosystem functions, we really wanna observe the conditions that the plant would be thriving in natural circumstances. Um, and, then, and then build from the benefits of that of that circum of those circumstances and the relationships between those plants. And so pictured here is um, actually a garden design that is now was going into its fourth year. And this I think is year three. And it was um, a kind of a forested ecosystem that um, was with this was transitioned into this kind of little forest garden. And the canopy species here, or the or what we see is what we're looking at, and the highest thing in the foreground is, or in the background is elderberry. And this is kind of like I'm, I, I brought the elderberry in because this is like a semi-wet um, native forest landscape, and these are places the elderberries really thrive. And then the other plantings around that are native shrubs. And then I mixed in a couple of grasses and perennials for pollinators and some kind of berries, gooseberries, which have some nice, um, uh, really sharp kind of spikes behind them to create a natural um, barrier from the deer. Uh, but anyway, so this is kind of like looking at, I know a little bit about elderberry in the native environment that it thrives. I know that it kind of likes wet feet, um, partial shade, and you know, integrated with other kind of um, native forests. So we're just, you can see that I didn't replicate that system exactly, um, but there are a lot of relationships that are happening between these plants. So that's really just kind of one example. Um, I found this picture recently and I really love it that identifies the forests, um, food forests living web. Um, so what I was talking about, like increasing those really millions of relationships, both above and below ground um, for pollinators, for soil life, um, nematodes, anthropods, bacteria. There's so many things that are enhanced when we start to combine different planting. Things of things of you know, flowers as like an obvious um, plant and species that brings pollinators, but we forget that native shrubs and trees are, well, I mean, I should speak for myself. Sometimes I forget um, that uh, native trees and shrubs are kind of amazing. Um, this, this is obviously obvious to us into the time when the cherry blossoms come out and you know, even the linden um, kind of more later in the season. Um, and so one of the ways to kind of integrate, integrate the different plantings of these things is by mixing trees and shrubs together. And these are often referred to as hedgerows, um, or there's another term that I'm, I'm loving and I'm really loving to use and, and design more of are uh, what we call fedges. And that basically just means a food hedge. And so that can be done with like elderberry and hazelnuts, which are both like really kind of full shrubbing um, uh, species that are, that are edible and medicinal. Um, and a number of different species that aren't just even um, for us. But um, anyhow, so, and then here there's a, most plants um, do require uh, insects for pollination, but not everything like for instance, hazelnut is wind pollinated. Um, but I've listed some here that are insect pollinated. 
And I just kind of think that are fun to have around and um, within our, just this like huge burst of color one time of the year. And then it's kind of just a, um, just a shrub, but I really started to appreciate it more because that the structure of the forsythia is actually incredible habitat to lots of different birds. And that yellow burst of color in the springtime, there is, uh, it is certainly good medicine for the eyes. So, um, it's back on the, on another top of my list, maybe the medium of my list. Um, but willow is a great tree for insects. And then I, uh, any kind of thing in the prunus family, which is plums, cherries, peaches, apricots, almonds, anything that has a pit, um, and a number of others, obviously. Um, so when we're thinking about organizing these systems for planting, um, what, I, what, we, what I like to think of is how many functions are we stacking? And I can be known to make quite the, a lot of jokes about stacking functions because really it's just kind of um, a, a, a nice way of saying that we are being efficient and um, multitasking, but really applied to growing systems, we're doing it in such a way that we apply one action and get many benefits. So that's really what we're talking about with stacking functions. Like when we incorporate comfrey, for instance, into our, um, gardens, we're not only like going to be increasing our soil fertility, we're also bringing pollinators and growing medicine. Um, so we can do that stacking functions by way of, um, you know, planting different things. And so these are kind of plants that would have different bloom times. So we want to make sure that anything in our garden, we have a um, an early bloom time, you know, as early as May, June, mid blooming to all to late blooming. So there's always some food for the pollinators. Um, there's always insects that are being drawn to your landscape and your foodscape. Um, and you're also really kind of within that process, like remember in the early part of the presentation, we looked at how in a forest, there's actually zero waste. Um, and once we start to garden like this, we see that in these systems, there's zero waste too, because like in the top right picture, for instance, is buckwheat. And um, once that grows, it actually has a fairly long bloom time. Pollinators absolutely love it. We can even integrate it. We think of it as a cover crop, but it's really easy to integrate into guilds with fruit trees just by way of kind of like scratching back, um, you know, a little bit of soil, maybe within seven to 10 um, inches in diameter and sprinkling, sprinkling some buckwheat seed. And then we can grow it in these patches. And it's really beautiful. And like, I guarantee you, you'll get people being like, what is that plant? <laughs> because we're not used to seeing it just in clumps. And, you know, we have to remember that like, there's, we, there's, a, there's a creative kind of license that can be actualized in our gardening. And um, this is one of them that I think is kind of a, um, a secret, uh, you know, kind of treat for the, for the guilds the fruit tree guilds is when we plant little pockets of buckwheat or um, alfalfa or even hairy vetch, which is something that can kind of grow to has this like root system that's very um, netty and kind of knotty and it's hard to pull out. And so, but by planting it in just little bits of space, it's also easier to kind of keep in check, especially when we're planting it around other things that, that can create like little natural boundaries. Um, but it's an easy way to kind of enhance those bloom times and get those flowers really integrated into the landscape so that you can have be feeding those pollinators um, all throughout the entire growing season. Um, so you've heard me talk about this term quite a bit now, um, insectaries. And these are plants that are specific for drawing, actually in some cases, very specific types of insects. Um, and these um, can be, we can plant these to draw predator insects that might want to eat things like aphids and mealybugs and any little plant that might be wanting to attack our plants, um, flea beetles. Um, and we might draw plants or, um, so anyway, I'm sorry, that, that's actually the grouping of plants that is insectaries. It's specific for insects, um, predators and also uh, pollinators. So um, there is a family, um, plant family called the Apiaceae family. And it's also in the, within the Umbelliferaceae. And, oh, I might've added a C in there. 
but that's what it sounds right to me. I might have spelled it wrong, but either way, what it is that the, what's important to remember is this plant family often has an umbelliferous flower structure. And so it just looks like an umbrella. And um, that is a beautiful plant that brings a lot of predatory wasps and other things that will eat and keep, keep the um, uh, insects from eating your plants and they'll keep those in check. Um, other things that are not that beyond just the umbelliferaceae plant are um, mints like cat mint and chives and chamomile, um, the flower of lemon balm, um, self heal and oregano. And the more diversity you have, um, the more different insects you will really draw. And I imagine a lot of us, a lot of us here tonight are actually already gardeners, so already have some kind of love of the natural world, but it really is phenomenal when we start to get these different plants integrated into our landscapes and even our annual gardens and to see what comes as far as insect life. Like I, I've been kind of intentionalizing more of taking images and photographs when I see beetles and just like really interesting insects. And, um, and I have a newfound appreciation, you know, beyond just the role that they play in this web of life, um, just for the incredible architecture and beauty that they provide. Um, so yeah, and so we're gonna talk about a couple more insectaries. Asteraceae family, this is kind of a late blooming family of flowers. Um, that, as you probably know, if you've seen any wild meadows, on the top right is echinacea or coneflower. It's also incredible immune boosting uh, medicine. And the flower on the left is tansy. And um, just a, a wonder, wonderful bringing a lot of parasitic wasps and um, insects and other things. Uh, other plants are cosmos, which is actually an annual, um, but I love them because I actually do see quite a lot of insects um, coming to that flower. Um, goldenrod, which I feel like is a, is a really special plant um, because of the love, the amount um, of populations that it does feed and draw. And I also feel that goldenrod has a special quality because it's the time of like goldenrod and aster that's blooming together. And, you know, Robin Wall Kimmerer, you may have heard of this book called Braiding Sweetgrass. She's, you know, she's a native uh, indigenous scientist and talks about the, what drew her into studying kind of plant biology and getting into her science was just this like wonder about like how they look, look so beautiful together, goldenrod and aster. Um, and on top of that, I also just feel like it, it's one of the plants that sends us into the fall in this time of like dark and contracting and winter and cold. And, um, and I, I feel like it does so in a really gracious and beautiful way. The goldenrod. So anyhow, a little tangent, sunflowers, tansy yarrow is something, we're going to look at yarrow's profile actually in the next couple of slides. Um, so the mint family, the lamiaceae family, these tiny little flowers in the bottom um, picture here is called nepeta or cat mint, uh, which is also a nervine, which is a tonic for our nervous system. So it can be grown as a tea, it can be grown as um, a plant for our cat friends. Um, it's, it's an incredible plant for pollinators and it has a really incredible structure to it. And like a lot of different herbs listed here in this slide, um, you can get multiple cuttings off of them. When I do my perennial gardens is I always, I allow them to come into full flower and actually go from the beginning of the flower to the end of the flower stage, which it, the more that you kind of notice and become familiar with some of these plant friends, you can start to see really clearly when those stages are occurring. Um, but then to cut that down and either, well, if it's past flowering, I'll cut that down and kind of add it to, um, you know, use it as a mulch. When we do that, what's called chopping and dropping, you can really put it right in place. Um, um, and then the, the second harvest will come in and I, I can dry that for tea, but I always leave the first flowers for insects and pollinators and also the last flowers for pollinators and insects. And in between those harvests, you can actually get two to four harvests a season, um, you know, depending on the soil health and conditions of the plants. Um, but the mint family of plants is easy to identify because it has a square stem. So um, the plant in the upper right, this is not the common color that we usually see this flower, um, but it's called bee balm or Menarda didyma. And um, I think that's how you pronounce the second name, but um, I just kind of like saying it like that. Uh, but anyway, this the one that we're looking at is Augustifolia, and it's actually the most native variety because it's that light purple. Uh, we're often used to seeing the cultivar, which is kind of a dark, um, darker red, kind of ruby red wine almost color. 
Um, but I, this is one of my favorites and I just love this structure um, because anything that has that tubule flower is getting enjoyed by like young, small insects, but also um, hummingbirds. So anything that has that kind of trumpet shape, you can imagine is really enjoyed by hummingbirds because they have those, um, the, pro, the proboscis, pro, what is it called? The, um, I'll come it, but anyway, the pro, proboscis, <laughs> the, um, the, you know, the, the, the beak of the hummingbird rather, and it's really beautiful. Um, and I know that, so I see hummingbird feeders all over the place and I'm always like, oh, we can plant gardens for them too. Um, because I think we forget because they do, you know, love that sugar water so much, but this is kind of more of a nutritious snack for them. Um, so some other favorites on this list are lemon balm, which is of course also is a great nervine and wonderful tea and some culinary herbs as well. Um, so this is a, um, alyssum or alyssum is um, a beautiful plant that I actually, I really came to love and appreciate when I was managing a nursery um, in Hartford Henderson's and um, we were getting this in and as putting them together as part of our annual baskets and you know, boxes and um, they're so aromatic. And I've really gotten, I started looking into what it was and also the, the reading up on it and learning about the benefits. Um, you know, this plant brings a number of different pollinating species early on to the annual garden. And it also provides um, ground cover, which helps to kind of retain moisture and um, suppress weeds. So, and it does it in, in such a beautiful way. Um, and so the bottom picture, I kind of have an example of what that looks like in a companion planting situation where we have some alyssum that is bordering the sidewalk in the garden and then some Swiss chard. And in the back, we see um, echinacea, coneflower, and it looks like there might be some cranes bill geranium mixed in there too. And then further down the garden, we see some kind of more vining plants occupying that space um, right above the ground. And I think it's just gorgeous. I, you can see how simple it is with three plants to really create like a mini niche system. And this is also what I'm referring to when I say, um, don't get so caught up thinking of like, oh, specifically which varieties because, you know, lavender, chamomile, strawberries, there's a couple of other things that I could imagine also occupying the space of the alyssum. But um, either way, um, another reason why I love this plant is because it has a really long bloom time. So I'm putting it in my flower boxes that I will often plant kale or spinach or Swiss chard in as well, similar to this border, um, you know, early on and then watching it kind of get big and occupy space and it will bloom the entire season. And similarly, if we put it directly into the ground. So it's a, it's a good one and it comes in a variety of colors. So, um, you know, kind of being a permaculturist, I'm often like, I, it's, you know, like we say coffee snob, I'm kind of a plant snob with like my natives and the cult and different cultivars, but this one has kind of made it to the top of my list because of the many benefits. Um, and also obviously you probably read here already, it brings lace wigs, which um, will continually kind of eat uh, aphids, mites, mealy bugs, white flies, um, you know, and all these things. So it's providing multiple functions. So here's our category of nitrogen fixers. Um, the, I just have a couple pictured here, which are some of my favorites. And on the left is called Baptisia, or people also, the common name is false indigo. And I love it because it's kind of reminiscent of lupin, but it's a little bit different. You can tell that it's in the pea family. And anything that's in that pea family is going to be putting nitrogen from the atmosphere, really fixing it directly into the soil, working with a, um, a symbiotic relationship with bacteria in the root system. So we really want to be integrating these as much as we can into our landscape um, around fruit trees. They work great. This would provide that kind of shrub layer um, because it's, it is a perennial flower, but I like to think of it more as a shrub because it can get up to three to five feet tall and it has a, quite the spread to it, this Baptisia. Um, but it does come in different colors and there's lots of cultivars. Um, but um, so yeah, and it's pretty versatile. It, it I can, I've actually grown it in um, really dry. There's some soil right next to a driveway that got really piping hot all summer. Um, and it did fine and it, re it really retained a nice amount of moisture and provided um, a really nice boundary. Um, this is a plant that I would use 
um, also as a boundary maybe to kind of line a pathway in just a certain section um, or to define a certain area um, because of the way that it kind of grows together and occupies really nice space. Um, on the right, we have uh, red clover, which is the medicinal variety. Um, clover is a beautiful plant. It's native. It's our Vermont state flower, as many of you might know. Um, it's super sweet, long bloom time, um, a really joy of a plant to harvest and make tea with. Um, I feel like we can kind of taste the sweetness of the sunshine and the soil within this one plant. It's just phenomenal. Um, and clover is also an example of an herb or a plant that um, has a way that it indicates to us what it is good for. And um, I don't have it pictured, but I'm, you can might be able to imagine on the leaf of a clover, um, there's kind of like a three-sided, it's not a triangle, because the, um, but it looks a little bit like the, a uterus. And um, it is actually an incredible tonic for the women's reproductive system and reproductive organs. Um, so I love that about nature. And the more that we grow plants um, and the more that we are kind of connected, even with the earth around us, we'll start to observe that there will even be plants that are native that are growing, that are occurring, that might have some medicinal benefit to us. Um, so anyway, clover is just great. So versatile pollinator, um, you know, draws a lot of the pollinators and there's just some really great reasons to be growing it. Um, in the bottom right, I have, uh, as you can tell, very similar white clover. And um, this I, has kind of, I've grown more appreciation for because oftentimes when we're creating these integrated kind of polyculture landscapes with guilds, um, you know, I often, the way that I do and design is I start with um, one of these trees that is going to provide the kind of, that's the centerpiece of the guild. And then um, those mulch rings and guilds around those trees are connected with this, um, a series of pathways. I just, I like designing that way um, because it makes it accessible to people that are also on wheels and it kind of connects these different little niches and, and food growing ecosystems. And so I've really appreciated white clover to seed as a pathway um, because it stays low. It, it feeds the pollinators when we're not on those pathways. Um, I guess theoretically there's some level of risk that you could step on a bee, but I ex really kind of expect people to, um, you know, be, be aware uh, because the benefits outweigh the risks with this one. Um, and, one, and one of the ways to do it is also, we can talk a little bit about methodology if people have questions about that, but oftentimes I will make um, pathways with wood chips. And what this does is it brings an incredible fungal life into the garden, which has a tremendous amount of benefits. But what, and it also like it breaks down over time and then it actually creates a really phenomenal seed bed for white clover at that point. So I kind of like to do things in phases um, that have different sets of goals. So like if I was making a pathway through an inte integrated guild landscape, um, you know, I would start with the wood chips and then slowly be transitioning to the clover. And sometimes you have to seed, you know, multiple years in a row to really get a nice mat. Um, but I've also seen more and more people doing these clover mixes instead of growing lawns. Um, the amount of inputs and um, that go into lawns, like when we really start to add it up and realize um, what we're that we have to shift um, climate change and resource conservation quite drastically. Um, you know, I, I'm really a food not lawns kind of person, and I can't stress enough to at least be growing some perennials in your landscape. Um, well, okay, let me just look at this list. What are other things that I'd like to talk about? Oh, I have beans and peas. So I also like to think of um, really getting out of the box in terms of annual and perennial growing combinations and integrating annuals really into the perennial landscape. Um, and it's easy to do this. I talked about it with buckwheat, um, but also with peas as well. Um, usually I, 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 I've done this occasionally, but I was, um, I've learned from some people too that with every fruit tree that gets planted, they'll often plant a ring of peas around it every spring. And I really love that because it is also, those peas become an indicator on how the tree is doing. You know, I often have to like reach down and, you know, you can feel the soil, but, um, if the soil is drying out, the peas will dry out and they'll tell you right away. So, um, and anyway, just to kind of occupy that space and be encouraging the vining um, species and varieties. And that can be really fun. Um, and then last listed on this list, I have sea berry, which is actually, um, it's, a, it's a fruit that is incredibly rich in antioxidants 
And some would argue that it's one of the most nutritious fruits in the world because of the um, kind of mineral and vitamin profile that it has. Um, but it does produce these clusters of thick, thick, thick orange berries along the stems. And it also is a nitrogen fixer. Um, the downside with this plant, and I, you know, it's funny, I don't have it pictured here, but there's a lot of information on the web about it. Um, but it has pretty substantial spikes. So harvesting it can be quite dangerous and you do end up sacrificing some skin. But um, I've also seen people just like chopping branches. Once you get it really established, it can get quite large. Um, but this plant would be a really perfect um, shrub to uh, create a boundary or a border around a garden where you don't want wildlife coming in um, because it grows like a thicket and it has those spikes. Um, so I just kind of think that and, you know, one of the ways that I've trained my mind to do after like working with all these plants over these years is to think of like how many functions are that can be created, but also which ones we haven't thought of yet. Um, Cause there's plenty of characteristics about a number of different plants, a lot that I'm even not gonna be, have a chance to talk about today that could be provided some function. Um, so yeah, it's kind of fun to think about things like that. Um, so these are nutrient accumulators. This is also a term you might hear of as, as um, called, referred to as dynamic accumulation, which is kind of a fun way of basically saying, you've heard me say this a lot now, but bringing minerals and water from the subsurface layers of the soil to the surface layers. Um, and we have alfalfa and borage, which is that beautiful star flower. It's a blue flower. It is also one of my favorite plants um, to plant for um, benefit, to bring beneficials to my annual garden and making, um, I, I make little, like when I make herbal teas, you can make ice cubes with the flowers um, just to kind of bring in some of that floral essence into our waters and tea is beautiful. Um, and also the seeds of borage are really high in omega-3s. So if you're vegan or vegetarian, it takes, it does take a tremendous amount of um, seeds to get that omega-3 amount, but it is something, and I do believe in, um, you know, small amounts of um, sometimes nutrients can just be beneficial for just that. Um, and then yarrow is kind of an unsung hero of the garden, in my opinion. Uh, she is one of my all-time favorite plants. Um, as you can see, she has the umbelliferous, she's the um, white flower on the top left of this picture. And she, the flower cluster, I think, is just kind of a beautiful um, reminiscent of a, like a gentle fairy flower almost. Um, but the, you know, pollinators love it. And it has this kind of really soft leaf that is multi-stemmed. And um, the Latin is millifolium on this one because it's like million stemmed, but um, it is a medicinal, it can stop um, bleeding and it can also help to heal uh, wounds, like just minor scrapes and bruises. So I put it in like hand salve, you know, infuse it with oil and melt it with beeswax to make some nice medicinal salve. Um, it's just a beautiful plant um, and it has those tap roots. So everything pictured here has either a small or large tap root that is providing that function of um, nutrient accumulation and recycling. Karen, before you move on, someone has a question about three of the plants you've mentioned. She asks, uh, hairy vetch, oregano and clover seem invasive to me. I'm fighting them. Should I just let them go or do you limit their behavior in some way? Um, yeah, I think that I, I don't, it depends. I've seen that some of that oregano that takes off um, and can be quite a pest. If it's providing a function, like if it's on an area that is sloped or if it's providing a ground cover, um, I would leave it. If you're wanting to incorporate other plants and more diversity into that space, I would treat it like a weed and pull it out of those areas that I don't want it. Um, I know that how, how that can be. I mean, the upside of it is you've got things growing in your garden. You've got to the point where you're weeding out things that are, you know, edible um, or providing food for pollinators. Um, you can dry it and, you know, that, all that. But um, yeah, that's my short answer to that question. And the vetch um, is often used as a cover crop in annual growing systems. So if you can stay on top of it, it doesn't end up getting out of control, but it, you know, that's tough because we can't always guarantee that we're gonna have endless time to stay on top of garden projects. I understand that's the reality, but yeah, I mean, I think ultimately we end up finding our favorites and kind of sticking with those because they're tried and they become tried and true for us. Um, 
yeah, any other questions there queued up, Jared? That's the only one so far. Okay, great. Um, so these, this is a grouping of plants that repel um, insects that might otherwise eat our plants. Um, so some of these, an easy way to think of it are things that are kind of very aromatic. Um, so all alliums would fit into this category. So there's chives, there's garlic chives, there's Egyptian walking onions, um, anything. And what this does is it basically, because they're so strong, it just confuses um, the noses of some of these insects. Um, so lemon balm, uh, lemongrass, I actually have as a plant that I put outside it and then I grow it inside uh, during the winter. Um, lovage is the plant that's pictured here in this picture on the bottom right. Um, I, this is actually kind of another one of those unsung perennial vegetables, I feel like. Um, it has a, um, a really like a celery-like quality and it is a perennial and it produces a tremendously huge stem that's hollow. They can be used for straws, which is actually really fun to do with kids. Um, but they're also really good in soup stock. Um, and so this is something that I would even dry in my oven at a low temperature and store um, as a dried herb and add it to soup stocks throughout the winter. And it provides minerals, nutrients, flavor. Um, it's just incredible. Um, so yeah, that's a couple of my favorites in that category. We have another question now. Uh, someone is asking, what are some plants that do well in the shade or partial sun? I'm looking to utilize those parts of my yard. Um, so some shade ground covers, actually it's funny, oregano. a lot of culinary herbs can tolerate a little bit of shade. Um, and there's other things that are like Solomon seal. Um, um, what is the one I'm thinking of? That, uh, uh, Cool clover can tolerate some shade. Um, and let me also, let me think about that a little bit more because I'm used to kind of like forested, you know, like columbine and heliobores. Like I have quite a perennial list. Um, and then, but as far as kind of like edibles, um, I'll have to think more about that um, because there are, there definitely are some kind of shade tolerant. And it also, it depends a lot on the quality of moisture, and then the um, if there's any sun at all. Um, okay, so let's see. Moving. Okay, we're, this is a little bit about garlic chives. Some of the specifics of a, some benefits of the chives um, that they deter the carrot flies and Japanese beetles, as well as aphids. The deer will kind of tend to stay away away from these, depending. Um, usually, there's enough other things for them to munch on. <laughs> Um, they promote pollination, so they're really they're good for um, put planting under fruit trees, and um, they provide a nice mulch. Um, and like if you don't tend to the chives, you'll see naturally they start to create these large um, clumps where the stems will start to fall on the outside, and then they'll start to kind of like grow from the middle. And um, but anyway, I, I just think they're also beautiful flowers. They can be used as decoration, um, you know, all kinds of different things. And this is another one I, I might try as a part shade ground cover because of the versatility. Um, and they also support, they're good companions with apple trees, um, carrots sometimes. And, and sometimes it's hard to think of like how to incorporate some of these into our growing systems, but I would and it enhances the garden aesthetic, but also the ecosystem functions. Um, parsley, roses, and strawberries is a nice combination because um, those support each other. Um, so here's kind of the plan profile for yarrow. I just wanted to go into it a little bit more in case there's any kind of, you know, plant and bug geeks out there in the crowd. <laughs> Um, it's a great nutrient accumulator, which also means that it's building soil because those leaves are providing that mulch. And you can see in that picture, you can now the um, leaf structure that has its multi-stemmed and it's so soft, just really beautiful. Uh, different colors it comes in. Also, I should say um, to enhance different pollinator impact um, or, or frequency rather, um, it's best to have different colors along in the color spectrum. So for instance, see, you can see in the yarrow in the bottom right picture, there's both light rose to kind of like deep, more of a kind of um, rose pink. And that color spectrum is great for pollinators. Similarly with like lilacs, 
you know, like instead of getting all one color of like the general purple, you can get, there's actually quite a lot of different colors um, along the color spectrum. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about Yarrow. Um, okay, so now we're gonna go, let me just check the time quick. So it's four o'clock. Um, it looks like I, I probably have, yeah, another 10 to 15 minutes. So we can, and then we'll go back into some questions if you have them. Um, so these are just some of my favorite kind of shrubs and ecosystem plants. This is Aronia, uh, uh, which is also called chokeberry. And the birds love these berries. You can see they're beautiful clusters of nutrient dense berries that we can also make them into juices, which I highly recommend combining with the sweeter berry because these are very tart, um, but they can be known to help regulate blood sugar, um, which is kind of amazing. And, and they're also beautiful. Their leaf produces an incredible, um, kind of like a nice fall foliage um, red spectrum. So it's, it's both color kind of, <coughs> excuse me, landscape enhancing, but also um, habitat providing with the birds. It blooms April through July, which is also a fairly long bloom time. <coughs> and um, mostly what I, the other reason I know they do well here, when I've seen them and I've planted them a lot in my installations, um, but also if you, the, you kind of go into a little native forest and maybe along a riverbed and you'll start to see quite a lot of aronia. <coughs> oh, they're anti-inflammatory and antibacterial. So yeah, incredible for habitat and humans. Karen is uh, asking yep. about wood chips. Are soft or a hardwood in vegetable gardens better? I've heard they give off different things as they break down. Yeah, um, there are different camps on that. And to be honest, um, what I do try to avoid are any plants that you know of that might be allelopathic. And that's, they put out a hormone that prevents things from growing around them like black walnut. Um, and then there are other benefits to hardwood that bring in different fungal colonies. But to be honest, I don't know like the science between the different colonies of bacteria and fungus. Mostly it would be the fungal profiles that would be different amongst the soft and hardwoods. And in the reality, like there's a lot of different concepts that we wanna try to um, achieve within our garden. And it can be really hard to kind of hunt down and find specific wood chip piles that are only one species or a hardwood or a softwood. Um, and it's becoming more um, common for, like I used to, when I first started gardening in this way, if I ever saw, and I think you can, this can still work, but I, if you saw, you know, a truck along the side of the road with wood chips, you know, I'd often say, hey, you know, could you dump those at my house? Because they are actually looking for places to offload the wood chips. But when I talked to VTrans about that this year, they were actually taking them all to this place outside of Fairly, where they're going to sit in a pile and be inspected because for, um, there's snake worms, there's specific things that are, and there's other variety things too, as, as well as the um, emerald ash borer and, um, and just diseases and insects that they're wanting to inspect before a lot of these wood chips are then going, you know, put out into the garden because obviously that would be a fast way to spread um, like an insect if it was burrowed into some of the wood. Um, so all said, to be honest, I really take the practical approach with this question and I use whatever I can get um, that's within a kind of reasonable proximity of where I am and kind of sticking within that local, like local vor applied to gardening realm. I do that for nurseries. Like I'm not, I try not to bring things in from out of the region um, and, and materials, compost, all of that. I think that we should be using what we have in this region um, if possible. And, and so I hope that answers your question. To be honest, the benefits outweigh any risk that I've ever seen with wood chips in a long time in long-term growing system, because of the fungal mycelium colonies that they're bringing to that system. And an example that I would utilize wood chips um, in is like when I'm making raised beds, like in a no-till growing um, annual gardening in system. I would bring in cardboard and put wood chips on top of that. And it is very effective for keeping your garden accessible and um, suppressing the weeds between those paths. And, and then to be honest, like what I was saying within the, um, that pathway, if you allow it just to break down, it will form incredible rich humus that I don't want competing 
like for like because it does take nitrogen to break down the carbon within those things and i don't want that nitrogen to be stripped from my annual growing systems so but i i don't find that to be the case with the wood chips just in the pathways and then i that my transition from that allow that wood chip and that soil life to break down and form that kind of humus and then go ahead and then put the clover down once that's really broken and there's a bed for clover, you know, which could take anywhere from like two to four years. Um, so yeah, and I, I don't think, and, and, and I don't encourage people to put wood chips directly into your garden bed. Um, but having that said that, within a fruit tree guild, and we're going to look at a couple photographs here, um, the perennials are, are actually thriving from that landscape that those wood chips are, are bringing because those are fungally dominated growing systems and that's what perennials really like and that organic matter allows the root zone to be able to kind of hold and sustain water retention so that actually that entire plant guild ends including the tree ends up needing less water and i have seen this time and time again using wood chips as a mulch because that medium more so than straw for instance which is mostly air um, creates a more of a rich grow, um, uh, soil organic matter content that ends up retaining more of that water. Um, and it, I, yeah, so I don't think like, I, so the benefits definitely outweigh the risks with this one as well. And um, yeah, I just, I can, it's, it's just so you can't argue the soil that gets built from incorporating wood chips into a garden. I'm actually doing an experiment this year too, where I'm putting tape that comes from cardboard for mulching um, into one area where it's a really high mycelium content that I've seen from um, applying wood chips to a uh, sheet mulched bed. And I'm going to do a test, a soil test before and after and see how much it breaks down and how what happens to the tape after, you know, one season. So I'll keep you posted. Um, that's a tangent, but Anyway, getting back to some species, Clether all this is also known as summer sweet. I meant to put the, some of the common names in here, but the habitat and the species and the insects that this plant provides is astronomical. It's also kind of mid to late blooming. People will often think, oh no, did my plant die? Was it winter kill? Because it, it blooms later, but that's actually better for the, the pollinators because we there's a lot of things that can flower early and kind of later even. So this covers that mid range. Dogwoods are incredible. Like you can see the bird habitat. There's like what 10, 12 species listed here um, that the dogwood provides um, uh, food for. And it's beautiful. There's a whole range of dogwoods. I really recommend shopping at local nurseries and, and, and getting to know some of the varieties. Um, they, these bloom from June to August. So that is a, also, you know, just a pretty good amount of bloom time. So that's supporting all the native habitat and those insects I was referring to, um, and the birds. So if you're a bird lover, um, having this on your landscape is an essential, um, along with there's a number of different trees and service berry and aronia I was talking about earlier, um, because, uh, you can really enjoy quite a lot of your day watching the different birds that will come and go from these clusters. And I do recommend planting in clusters, um, you know, between five and eight feet apart for some of these dogwoods and to give them enough space, you really wanna keep the airflow open around them, but um, mixing a service berry and some dogwoods and maybe some viburnum, which we're gonna talk about. I think that's the next one. Oh, here's service berry. Um, this is a beautiful kind of like mid story. Um, this, I, I would plant a service berry in a nut guild. Um, not a hazel burnt or a kind of a shrub type nut, but a, a larger nut, like a black walnut even, or um, which would be huge. I don't recommend planting those if you don't have more than a couple acres, um, but other like a, a chestnut, for instance, American or Chinese chestnut. Uh, but anyhow, these are beautiful. They're early, early blooming. And a fun story about service berry is that um, they are called service berries, one of the names for this plant, because when it started to bloom, that it was an indicator that the soil had thawed enough to be able to plant the people that had passed away over the winter time in the ground. Um, so I hope that's not too dark, especially the, during this time living in the plague. Um, but anyway, that, so that's that it's also known as Juneberry, Saskatoon. Um, it's just a gorgeous, beautiful um, a shrub that produces these clusters of berries that taste similar to a blueberry. I'm not kidding, very, very similar. 
and um, have high antioxidants, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin K, kind of you know really good uh, vitamin profile antioxidants. It's known to be blood building and kind of boosting that vitality. So um, I made my first service berry pie um, two summers ago and it was phenomenal. I, I, I really it was quite um, blown away by this little kind of humble fruit. And so it's great to kind of line meadows with. Um, you can incorporate, this could also be the um, centerpiece of your guild. And you can plant, you know, things like baptisia or gooseberry or honeyberries, um, which are early kind of fruiting berries that are uh, kind of similar to the blueberry. You could have blueberries, you could have an entire kind of diversified, you know, blueberry service berry, honeyberry guild, um, all working towards pollinators, insects, birds, and medicine. I mean, it's quite phenomenal, I think. Uh, yeah, so it's one of my favorites. <laughs> okay, so here's the viburnum. Um, the bottom right picture is viburnum trilobum. It's the high bush American cranberry, and it has these kind of clusters of bright red berries. And I actually learned about this one in the books um, when I was really kind of getting into specific uh, edible perennials and shrubs and trees. And um, it's known, I mean, it's a theoretically support, so, <laughs> supposed to support um, bird species with these nutrient dense berries. But to be completely honest, um, I see these clusters of berries existing on these plants all through the winter, even into the spring. I think it's the last resort for some of the birds. I don't know why they taste so bad. We can make them into jams and jellies with quite a lot of sugar uh, and they're nutrient dense. I mean, it's like, why not grow them? They're gorgeous um, native as well. And, um, and I think that sometimes I question whether the birds could have found them after I've planted them or, or what the deal is, but there's really, um, there's a lot of other things that this plant supports and I've used it to actually um, reclaim areas that have been taken over by honeysuckle. And as you know, this is a plant that like literally lines our Vermont highways in certain places. Um, and so I tried this experiment where it was like mostly actually honeysuckle and goutweed, believe it or not, which is um, and it's, a, it's a ground cover. Well, it was, it was planted as a ground cover in kind of the 80s, but then it ended up being and it would take over. And, um, and so what I did is a heavy, heavy sheet mulching. I removed it as much as I could by hand and then sheet mulched it. And I planted um, these viburnum trilobums, a couple of abelias um, and some other shrubs of viburnum, dogwood, and have successfully so far kept up the honeysuckle and the goutweed. So it's, it's fun to kind of reclaim areas and plant more diversity in native. Um, and of course the bird habitat that these, that viburnums bring um, are, um, is, is a big list here. The cedar waxwings, a good, is a favorite among many, hermit thrush, ruffed grouse, wild turkeys. Oops. Uh, okay, well, moving right along, I'm gonna kind of zip through. Karen, yeah. we do have two questions. Yes. Oh, uh, great. Is noting that New Hampshire State nurseries offer bundles of bird habitat plants. Do you know, are these good to grow or difficult to grow? Is the first question. Bird habitat plants? Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, what is the, um, the, the bundles that they put together? I, I mean, I would ask them and trust that they would put together a native bundle that is good for habitat and not I mean, the most important things to be looking at when you're going to nurseries, nurseries is making sure that they're not using any neonicotinoids. That is the ingredient that is linked to colony collapse syndrome among bees. And there is cert there's currently no organic certification for perennials. Um, so what you wanna do is make sure that the nurseries that you're buying from, they're getting from places like Van Berkham is a really good nursery. They don't use any nicotinoids. Um, and then when you bring it to your landscape, making sure that they're, anyway, so that's like, there's no neonicotinoids or there's no kind of like miracle grow or like, I'm really kind of a purist when it comes to what I'm putting into the environment and don't rec and I, when you're growing like this, there's no need to kind of be putting in things that were, are dependent on fossil fuels or other industries that aren't really good for the planet. Um, Anyhow, so yeah, I bet those bundles are pretty cool. I think that's great that they're doing that. And I think it makes it really easy because there's a lot of guilds that could work together really well. And the second question is, what were the berries in the berry guild besides blueberry and service berry? Honey berries. So actually this is a really amazing berry. We don't realize because of the way that fruit has been commercialized in some ways, the diversity of foods that we can be growing. 
And so honeyberry is, it's actually in the honeysuckle family and it grows, I've seen well fertilized, it can get up to six feet tall, but generally I see it hovering around four to five feet tall. Um, so very similar to the growth pattern of a blueberry. And it has the same kind of leaf structure as a honeyberry. That's kind of an indicative um, ident identity quality. Um, but the berries are actually longer than a blueberry. They're kind of oblong and they're very sweet and they come in early, like in June. So before your typical blueberry. And I didn't really do a plant profile on them, but um, yeah, I did want to mention the honeyberry because it's a great, it's a great one. And you can get them locally at Henderson's Nursery and uh, Route 14 in Hartford or also at EC Browns in Thetford. They, they have kept those in stock, I think. And I've planted them and I, I've seen them kind of, you know, they have a, they three, after three, five years, they're just really producing bumper crops of berries. Um, okay, I think I have just a couple more slides um, and we have about 12 minutes. So, so here's just, I just wanted to give another visual of like what it really looks like to plant a guild. This is from above um, where you would have, this would be a fruit tree guild um, and bulbs we haven't talked about too much, but things like daffodils, you know, bulbs are really incredible. They don't get enough credit for the ecosystem function, functions that they provide because what's happening there is that the water and um, is actually getting stored in the bulb and then put into the soil um, when the, through the storage process that the bulb goes through when leaves start to die back. Um, so it's actually quite cool. And um, also through the leaves, because the, the, these are like daffodils are obviously really early blooming. There's a lot of foliage and then the flower comes. So as those start to die back, they kind of really um, do a good job adding you know, all that nutrient and recycling water to the soil. Um, so yeah, just an example, there's no, I, I would not be like strict or regimented about your planting pattern. I would combine things. Um, you can move things and planting a guild. I will say it's important to kind of get these established within the first kind of two or three years of the tree's life before the roots kind of really end up, um, some fruit trees or like apple trees, once they're established, you can't really plant and they're around their mulching. Um, so yeah, get them established early and then What's also nice about this is you can take your, you know, you can go out, you can inspect your fruit tree, you can look to see if it's got anything going on, um, and then harvest herbs and things to take in to make your salad with, or, you know, cut up some nice fresh spring chives to throw in your eggs and your omelet in the morning. Kind of fun. <clears throat> okay, here's an example of a peach tree guild. We have um, comfrey, uh, there's other things kind of growing, like it looks like a little bit of a mint, maybe even like a, that looks like orange mint to me. Um, it looks like some dandelions have kind of let go, which is always good. Dandelions are incredible. I, if you came to my earlier talk, you heard me spout out about how much I love dandelions because they're just incredible. Um, but yeah, always good to get an allium in there to, you know, confuse those, remember that's the aromatic confuser, as we say, um, confuse those pests that might otherwise eat your plants. Um, get some, you know, yarrow, comfrey, borage for those uh, nutrient accumulating and also mulching qualities. And of course, um, Cosmos, I was saying, oh yeah, the Trichogamma wasp. Um, that's, I was trying to come up with that earlier when I was referencing Cosmos. Um, so yeah, I think that you really kind of training our eye as well to recognize it's sometimes like, I think it's similar to when we have to, you know, or when we might intentionalize to start eating more kale, like kale to someone that might not have ever had it before. Maybe it's a little bitter. Maybe it's too, you know, it's just not the, the, the flavor profile that is really encouraging of us. But once we start to realize the incredible benefits, and I, I really find that it's a similar with gardening that like we, we then like really choose it and encourage it. Um, you know, this garden might look kind of messy and untamed, but the ecosystem functions that are occurring and the, the pollination and the, um, niches that are being supported by growing these things together is just astronomical. So, you know, I, 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 I personally do not find landscapes that are either lawns or even just a couple of trees kind of mixed in, um, to be any way aesthetically pleasing or yeah, my nervous system doesn't respond the same way to those systems. But, oops. Oh, is that the last? No, it's not the last. Well, let me go back to presentations somehow. 
Um, so this is just an example of what, uh, from above, like what an integrated landscape design would look like, you know, so you can have, you can imagine in this area, picture on the right, there's a couple areas where you would have little forest guilds, you know, maybe you'd have like, this would be a fedge, maybe elderberries and hazelberts kind of growing together here along a fedge, maybe there's a couple of service berries and aronias mixed in, um, or maybe you have some pockets on the, on the corners, that's always fun, and there's some pathways, maybe there's some currants and berries over here. Um, so it's kind of fun, you know, to think about different examples um, of how to integrate these. Okay, and so here we go. This is my last slide. Just thank you. And then I do, I thank you for listening. Thank you for your attention. I really hope that you have gained some new knowledge or some inspiration um, for your growing time and growing season. And I wanted to list here a, a couple of resources I also list on my last slide. Uh, the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition, they have an upcoming series um, that's kind of like soil health, community, and climate stories from the north. Uh, this is a free online series. Um, I think it's happening on Wednesdays. Um, Dee Dee Pursehouse is starting a new land and leadership series. So if these are like these topics of kind of ecosystem restoration, land management, and kind of species selection and are, if these are interesting topics to you, um, there are a lot of opportunities to dive deeper with them. And I can't recommend the, the knowledge of Dee Dee Pursehouse more. Um, so she's got this Regenerating Landscapes for Community and Climate Resilience. That is starting on February 8th and it goes to February 12th. So it's a little bit of a deep dive into understanding the soil sponge, which is, you know, talking about ecosystem functions, it's essential. Um, Grow More, Waste Less, Kat Buxton is awesome. Um, she's an incredible soil consultant and um, grower and has worked with a lot of schools in the area and just a good resource. Um, and then YouTube, there's there's obviously a tremendous amount of knowledge out there, but uh, Walter Yenne, and can't recommend him enough for understanding, again, like the soil, the water table, how these things work together and how we can like really grow for increased biomass, um, which could help to restore our ecosystems. Um, okay, thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And if people have any questions uh, or need anything, you know, follow up emails, um, we can get that all sorted out. Okay, how are we doing? That was a lot. I basically just rattled around for almost an hour and a half, although we didn't start. So um, if you are like just still integrating, absorbing information, you're welcome to contact me with questions at another time. Um, as we said, this is gonna be recorded. So um, you can also reference back to it. We do have a few minutes for questions. If anyone has one before we go, feel free to unmute yourself and turn your video on and ask it. Um, how do I access the videos of the first two sessions? All the videos are on our U the How Library YouTube channel. So if you were to go to YouTube and search for How Library Karen Ganey, it would okay. come up. And when I send out the link for this one, when it is up, I'll send this out to everyone that I have an email address for. Um, and you'll be able to find them all in the same place. Thank you. Mm. I I'm curious. Um, you mentioned that you often base um, guilds around trees. If you're thinking about um, lower growing plants that require more sun, how would you sort of balance that with the fact that trees sometimes uh, create some shade? Like, yeah. Yeah, with the trees in an area that is getting full sun throughout the day, um, believe it or not, there's enough kind of like Eastern midday or Western sun that will hit some of those plants. Unless it's like a huge, you know, like it's a really, like, because a tree, especially a fruit tree should be pruned in such a way that air and light can circulate through. Um, so I've seen things like chamomile, strawberry, lemon balm, you know, the herbs I would say are the good shade tolerant ones too, but um, that have all thrived in a, in a fruit tree guild, perennials, chives, um, comfrey, and I did see a question someone wrote, which is the, the Russian variety of comfrey is the less invasive. It's the common one that people are more afraid of growing because it spreads. Um, but yeah, so I haven't found that to be like the biggest problem, to be honest. Even like bulbs will do fine, daffodil bulbs. Um, the peas, when I was saying planting the peas around the stems of the newer fruit trees, those will sometimes be a little stunted, you know, because that's an annual vegetable that's used to getting full sun. 
So yeah. it sounds like there are a lot of benefits to having the peas under the fruit trees as well. So I imagine that. Yeah, you know, and sometimes depending, you know, we get so many seeds and then we plant them out and we've got a few extras. It's another way to kind of use, utilize those. Yeah, thank you for your question. I hope that was helpful. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you everyone for coming and Karen, thank you so much. I hope you'll all join us for the last in the series, which will be two weeks from today. Good, excellent. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. All. Have a thank wonderful you. evening. Great info. Oh, good, good. Thank you so yeah, much. Really good. Thanks for about the comfrey. I've got tons of the invasive. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, you can chop and drop it and to kind of keep it in check. Um, Cause I, I know that it is, it's like, that's the double, you know, it's like, I feel like even in humans, we have these gifts. There's always an underside to the gifts. Sometimes the plants are the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, thank you for Thank coming. you. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank, thank you. you so much, Karen. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.